Okay, so finally this brings us to alternative medicine. What about alternative medicine? How do we take our understanding that hopefully we have now about the limitations of our individual judgment, about the value of science in evaluating medical therapies, and about some of the specific principles and techniques of evidence-based medicine, how do we take those things, incorporate them into our five-step approach, and evaluate alternative therapies? Well, first, we have to do a little defining. We have to talk about what alternative medicine is exactly, or as exactly as we can define it, and how it works. What are its principles and what are some of its practices? And then we can go through and specifically apply our methodology to specific ideas. There's a great deal of terminology that is used in a complex way in alternative medicine, and terms are often used either interchangeably or with very specific meanings by particular individuals, and it can be quite a mishmash trying to figure out exactly what we mean, what we're all talking about here. So I'm just going to go through some of the most common terms and generally what they're understood to mean, and then we can hopefully have at least a language that we can use to talk about this stuff. The first term is alternative. This is somewhat of an older term. It's rarely found by itself these days. And it means essentially an approach to health or disease, which is an alternative to conventional science-based medicine, which should be used instead of regular mainstream medicine. And there are some practices such as traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine that are presented as complete therapies, complete approaches to health and disease that don't require any contribution from mainstream scientific medicine. And one of the reasons why this term is not so commonly used today is that it wasn't very successful with consumers. The effectiveness of conventional science-based medicine is undeniable and well accepted by most pet owners and by human patients. And very few people, even who are dedicated to some of the philosophical principles or specific techniques of alternative medicine, seriously want to dis do away with conventional medicine altogether. And so this term is, is only typically seen now in combination with other terms. Most commonly, complementary. Complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM, is probably the most commonly used umbrella term to refer to all of these therapies that we're referring to. Complementary came along as a way of saying that these therapies could be applied alongside of conventional medicine or in addition to in those areas which conventional medicine perhaps didn't have obvious effective approaches for treatment. And some practitioners of unconventional therapies object to this because it does imply a sort of add-on or second-class status for these therapies. A more popular term today, particularly in the alternative community, is integrative medicine. This is a way of saying that all interventions, whether they are ultimately science-based or they are based in other kinds of approaches for understanding or other cultural traditions, are simply tools in a toolbox, and we can pick and choose whatever tools seem appropriate for a given patient and integrate them seamlessly together. So integrative medicine might, for example, be doing chemotherapy on a patient with cancer diagnosed in a Western way, and at the same time using acupuncture to treat nausea in a way that is guided by traditional Chinese medicine principles, yin and yang, the five elements, things that have nothing to do with the scientific approach. And this has been a very successful model marketed to consumers. I think, as we'll see when we go a little further along, there are some problems with it, and it's not quite as simple as this uh, term makes it seem. Holistic is another term that's frequently used. In its simplest form, all it means is looking at the entire patient in the context of their life. And I think any good doctor does this. When someone brings you a dog with a limp, you look at its teeth and its gums and its eyes and you listen to its heart and you palpate its abdomen. Hopefully you do all of these things. You ask about its diet, about its activity history, about its exposure history to other animals. The whole patient in context is 
key to understanding health and disease. Unfortunately, holism or the idea of looking at the whole patient once is often presented as a yes or no binary alternative to reductionism, that you can't both understand complicated things by looking at their parts and at the same time look at the whole in its context. And an extreme holism raises some problems which I think are seldom acknowledged. If you say I look at everything about the animal's life and everything about its environment, that raises the question of relevance. If you have a pet who comes into you with a limp, are you going to ask the owner, you know, did they used to smoke 10 years ago? Or do you know if the dog's mother lived in a house where they had linoleum floors instead of tile floors? I mean, not every fact about the environment or the animal is relevant to every problem. And people who practice what they claim is holistic medicine certainly make judgments about the relevance of particular factors just like everybody else. But sometimes I think they imply that they aren't making these judgments, that they are truly seeing everything all at once, which is in its simplest sense a literal impossibility to, to see the connection of an individual patient to everything else in the universe is simply not something anybody is capable of. So this is a term which I think has some legitimate meaning and usage, but is often misused to represent something which is not actually possible, much less desirable. Natural. Here's a term which is commonly tacked on to a lot of alternative or unconventional therapies and frankly is pretty meaningless except as a marketing term. In the simplest evaluation, it's difficult even to define what is natural. How much human processing is necessary to take something from being natural to being artificial. Some people would argue that cooking our food is unnatural. Some people would argue that that engineering plants through selective breeding to make you know wheat that looks different from the original grasses that our ancestors first started eating is unnatural and that wheat is unnatural. Other people go much farther and say that synthetic chemicals are unnatural but exactly the same chemical when derived from a natural source even through extensive processing is still natural. So it's a word that's very difficult to define in any meaningful way and unfortunately its use is primarily driven by the concept, misconception that something which we define as natural in some way is automatically safe and beneficial. And I frequently point out to people that uranium is natural and rattlesnake venom and salmonella and dysentery, I mean the list goes on. There are many, many things which are perfectly natural and really bad for you. And then there are things like penicillin and smallpox vaccine and toilet paper which are clearly artificial and yet very beneficial. And so I think this is a, a term which is frequently part of the marketing of alternative therapies, but if looked at closely, doesn't have a meaningful definition and implies some things which aren't true anyway. So CAM or CAVM, complementary and alternative medicine, complementary alternative veterinary medicine, definitely the most common umbrella term and it's a way of, of bundling together these therapies so we can talk about them even though they have significant differences among them. So in search of a definition of alternative or complementary and alternative medicine, there are a couple of places you can go. The AVMA has created a definition. This was a consensus definition put together by a committee and we all know how effective such things are usually and it was a committee that included both proponents of these methods and skeptics of these methods. So this is one of those definitions that attempts to please everybody and, and generally fails. However, it's a useful starting point. It begins by identifying that the act of defining CAM is itself challenging and controversial. And then it gives a definition which is frequently cited. CAM is a heterogeneous group of preventative, diagnostic, and therapeutic philosophies and practices. So there we have some key words, I think. Heterogeneous, meaning there are a lot of things that are very different from one another as well as different from conventional medicine. Preventative, diagnostic, therapeutic, like hopefully all of our approaches to medicine. Philosophies and practices. Not only are we talking about tools in the toolbox, about specific interventions, we're talking about an approach, a perspective. There are some philosophical principles underlying these approaches and I think these differ in meaningful ways and important ways from some of the philosophical principles that underlie the scientific approach.
The theoretical bases and techniques of CAM may diverge from veterinary medicine routinely taught in North American veterinary medical schools and may differ from current scientific knowledge or both. This is key. I think a lot of alternative therapies are alternative by definition because they are defined in terms of their opposition to what is conventional or mainstream. So part of the definition of alternative medicine, for better or worse, is things that are not conventional or mainstream medicine. Here's a definition from the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association, which is one of the largest groups that represents practitioners of this diverse set of unconventional therapies. Holistic or integrative veterinary medicine, so already we're combining terms and using them somewhat interchangeably, is the examination and diagnosis of an animal considering all aspects of the animal's life, so we're implying a certain holism, and a combination of conventional and alternative or complementary modes of treatment. So here we've already got holistic, integrative, complementary, alternative. You know, we've used a bunch of these terms all together because frankly we're not entirely sure what each of them means. The techniques used in holistic medicine are gentle, minimally invasive, and incorporate patient well-being and stress reduction. So now we're starting to put some values into these definitions, right? We're talking about this as something that is alternative to conventional medicine, but in specific ways that have to do with intention, attitude, and perspective. Holistic thinking is centered on love, empathy, and respect. Now these are, I think, values that we all appreciate and that we all think are good things, and hopefully that all medicine incorporates to some extent. But sometimes these subjective, intentional ideas are viewed in alternative medicine as more central to the practice than perhaps some less uh, emotional or psychologically resonating concepts such as evidence or research results. So some of the differences here we're beginning to see have to do with attitude or perspective as much as with uh, the specific techniques employed or the evidence used to justify them. One more, this is from the Veterinary Institute of Integrative Medicine, which is another educational group that represents a lot of uh, alternative practitioners. Holistic medicine is a healing philosophy, which views the patient as a whole body rather than as a disease or collection of symptoms. A patient's emotional and spiritual state can affect the patient's condition. And holistic practitioners may combine traditional forms of treatment with alternative forms. And then there's a list of some of the more common alternative therapies employed. Homeopathy, acupuncture, chiropractic, herbal medicine. Those are certainly, you know, the big four. Those are certainly some of the most common by far. So again, a combination of specific techniques and also philosophical perspective. So what are some of the characteristics of alternative medicine, some of the defining features? One of them is eclecticism, or what's called syncretism, bringing together ideas from very disparate traditions or perspectives and treating them as all equivalent. As you know, we've seen from the very beginning, it's difficult sometimes to talk about alternative medicine because it is so heterogeneous. It has so many different things contained within it and when one starts to look at the theories behind the different practices, they seem incompatible. They seem to be just as different from one another, if not more so, than, than from conventional scientific medicine. And yet they seem to fit together. And one of the reasons for this is that eclecticism, that a borrowing from multiple traditions is part of the values that underlie the alternative medical philosophy. And so the apparent contradiction doesn't seem to disturb people who practice these multiple modalities together because they see it as a strength to put together things which seem in, in their details unrelated and incompatible. There may also be a more pragmatic reason for this eclecticism, which is that because alternative medicine is to some extent defined in opposition to conventional medicine, things are lumped together which might not fit together if they weren't to some extent in a category uh, that views itself as discriminated against or excluded from the mainstream. There are some just very practical political reasons why people join forces who practice therapies which are considered outside the mainstream or unconventional. And again, 
alternative medicine frequently is defined in terms of its opposition to conventional medicine, both by proponents of it and by critics. There is certainly some ambivalence about scientific evidence in the alternative community. There is no question that there are practitioners of CAM therapies who are very committed to an evidence-based and a science-based approach. I think they are the exception more than the rule, but there absolutely are some out there, and, and I, I appreciate the efforts they make to make some changes in how CAM is evaluated and practiced. And there's no question that almost everybody is willing to trumpet the results of scientific research that supports their point of view. So positive studies are, are accepted by almost any practitioner of any of these unconventional therapies. The problem is that negative studies are generally dismissed or ignored, and the very notion that scientific evidence is necessary to justify employing these practices is not widely popular. It is considered at best icing on the cake, but not the cake. So philosophically, or, or from the point of view of epistemology, what is alternative medicine? <clears throat> and again, this is a very complex and interesting area, and, and I could say a lot more about it for the sake of, of time and efficiency. I'm going to try to just hit a few of the highlights. In contrast to some of the notions of realism, that the universe exists pretty much independent of human perceptions or thoughts, that it is what it is regardless of how we think about it, and that we can engage and understand it through our senses and through an empirical evaluation, there's a strong strain of postmodernism or more specifically constructivism as a philosophical point of view. What is this? Postmodernism, very complex and multifaceted set of philosophical ideas, but in, in this context, from a simple point of view, it means the idea that our models of reality, our way of understanding things, the metaphors that we use, the language that we create to describe the world, are so heavily influenced by our pre-existing beliefs and understandings that they cannot be viewed as really true representations of how the world actually is. When I say the cat has hyperthyroidism because it has an excess of thyroid hormone, the constructivist point of view says that's really just a metaphor. That's just a way of imposing your perspective uh, as a human being in a particular cultural and historical moment on the world. And it may not be a true representation of reality. It's, it's too filtered by your beliefs and understandings of things to actually be seen as true in any deep, meaningful sense. And this is tied into the notion of cultural relativism. So the people who, who hold this point of view would likely then say the traditional Chinese medicine way of describing that same cat might be uh, an excess of yang or uh, might have something to do with uh, weather metaphors or metaphors having to do with elements, fire, water. And that that system of explaining things is also a set of metaphors that is dictated or defined primarily by the cultural and historical context in which it was derived and is just as valid. There is no legitimate way to say that one cultural perspective or one individual's perspective even on the nature of health and disease and the nature of the physical universe is more true or more valid than another. Clearly this creates some problems for evidence-based medicine because evidence-based medicine is very clearly about evaluating the reliability and the truth value of different kinds of evidence and placing them in a hierarchy where some are more true than others. And cultural relativism and postmodernism together cast a lot of doubt on whether that's a legitimate activity. And they prefer to view all of our ways of describing the world as sort of equally valid sets of metaphors that are really very loosely connected to how the world itself actually is. And I think there's a deep philosophical conflict between that way of looking at things and the realist, empiricist, uh, or logical positivist way that underlies a lot of the scientific method. And then vitalism, a key component to many of these therapies, of these alternative practices, is the notion that health and disease are fundamentally determined at their core by spiritual 
energies of some kind, and each has a slightly different way of defining what that means, but by non-physical entities that give life its characteristics that distinguish living from non-living. And these approaches view that vital force, whatever it may be, as the key to maintaining health and to restoring health in patients with illness. And any approach to treating disease that doesn't incorporate treatment of the spiritual or the non-physical is ultimately going to fail. This is clearly a problem when you take the scientific approach of methodological naturalism. When you say, look, in scientific medicine, we're not going to talk about the spiritual element of our patients' lives. If it exists at all, it is not something that we can say anything about because it's not possible to share data about it. It's inherently subjective and intangible. And people on the side of many of these alternative therapies would say, you've just missed the whole point. Conventional medicine can never be truly effective because it ignores the key element, the single most important element to health and disease. So there's a conflict there, again. And holism versus reductionism, I've talked a bit about that before. I think holism in a reasonable interpretation simply means not forgetting to look at the whole context of the patient and the whole body and not getting excessively focused in on one narrow part. And that's appropriate, but it can be carried to extremes where it implies that one is somehow evaluating everything that, that is, is associated with the patient in its environment, every connection between the patient and the entire universe, and somehow incorporating all of that into a diagnostic and treatment plan, which I don't think makes any sense. And reductionism is, in its most reasonable form, a simply a powerful tool for understanding, for, for breaking complicated things down into their parts and looking at their parts. It doesn't have to involve denying that the whole organism or the whole system may have properties that can't be entirely understood by looking at their components. Uh, that sort of greedy reductionism isn't necessary for evidence-based medicine, but some acceptance that breaking things down into pieces and looking at them that way is useful is necessary for practicing in a scientific kind of epistemology. Panepistemia, this is a term I made up, and, and all it means is that there's a tendency in the alternative medicine community to view various forms of evidence as equally valid or legitimate and equally compelling. And in particular, to view the evidence of anecdote, of individual experience, of history and tradition as just as compelling and just as cogent as scientific research evidence. Again, it's very clear where the conflict is here between this approach and scientific or evidence-based medicine, which relies on a certain scientific skepticism, that scientific empirical data is indispensable in evaluating a therapy and that trying to do without it and rely solely on history or tradition or anecdote is missing really the most useful kinds of evidence. So again, personal experience, intuition, tradition, authority, the word of very important and respected people are seen as just as legitimate as any other form of evidence, which is not compatible with an evidence-based. So I'll just give a few quick examples of some of these characteristics so that you can get a sense of, of how these manifest in the domain of alternative therapies. This is a partial table of contents from the uh, leading textbook for complementary and alternative veterinary medicine. And as you can see, there's a wide variety of therapies on here, ranging from comprehensive approaches to disease like traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic veterinary medicine, to fairly biologically based therapies like herbal medications, manipulative therapies, chiropractic and massage, Nutrition, which I think one could argue is, is like physical therapy, is a conventional approach, even though some of the specific recommendations from this textbook may be different from conventional recommendations. But imagining that nutrition is an important part of health is not inherently alternative in any way. And even technological therapies like photon therapy, magnetic field therapy, quite a wide range of things, many of which, again, seem 
incompatible with one another when you read their explanations for disease. But if you take a postmodernist perspective and say that all of those explanations, all those theories are just metaphors and they should all be viewed as equally valid, then suddenly this doesn't seem to be such a problem. And again, Alternative medicine can frequently be defined primarily because it is not conventional medicine, and even proponents of, of CAM will define it this way in many cases. The concept of holism stands in direct opposition to the Western reductionist view. So one of the ways of marketing alternative therapies is to explain how they're not like conventional medicine. Western medicine is subtractive and uses the reductionist philosophy in both scientific investigation and treatment of medical problems. In general, CAM promotes diversity and individualization. So again, we're setting up the philosophical differences as part of the way of understanding why alternative medicine is alternative. And here is a set of metaphors which I particularly like. This author talks about the doctor of Western medicine being trained to detect diseases and disorders, to see where the body has malfunctioned, and to repair or replace the damaged part. Fixing the machine is the metaphor used to describe conventional Western medicine. Makes it sound a little like auto mechanics. The practitioner of Chinese medicine strives to view the patient and the disease in terms of their relationship to each other, so processes and interactions, but not parts, and helps the body return to a balanced state, thereby tending the garden. So they are gardeners in Chinese medicine, and conventional doctors are auto mechanics. Obviously, that's an oversimplification, and this author might even acknowledge that. But the way that this approach is defined is by how it is not like conventional medicine. And sometimes this definition in opposition can get quite aggressive. This is from a website for a uh, holistic or alternative veterinarian who has gone so far as to name her website Holistic Vet Expert, so certainly presenting herself as an expert in the field. Dr. Preston practiced allopathic medicine. This is a term invented by um, Samuel Hahnemann, who, who invented homeopathy in the 19th century and is used almost exclusively by practitioners of alternative medicine as a somewhat derogatory way of describing conventional or science-based medicine. Dr. Preston practiced allopathic medicine for 25 years before realizing that the vaccinations and drugs she dispensed daily were causing more problems than they ever solved, and often to a more severe degree. So the leading income producer in her practice, vaccines, was obviously creating havoc in most of her patients. The drugs prescribed every day were literally destroying healthy organs and shortening lives. One of the ways in which alternative medicine is marketed to animal owners is through talking about how misguided and in fact dangerous conventional medicine is. And so part of the ethos of the alternative medical community, or at least some elements within it, is to identify themselves as not only an alternative, but as a safer, gentler, kinder, better alternative to what is really a terribly aggressive and probably damaging approach to health and disease that is conventional or science-based medicine. So this is more than just differences of philosophy, this is also politics, economics, and the def definition of alternative therapies in opposition to conventional medicine for reasons that have nothing to do with the science underlying them. Just a quick review, since it's a complicated subject, postmodernism or constructivism says that reality, our descriptions of reality, our way of understanding it, is socially constructed. It's an artifact of history and social cultural context, and that everything is built out of metaphors. All different ways of knowing about reality, all different sets of metaphors, are ultimately equally valid. And any claim to objectivity or to real truth is unjustified and frankly politically motivated. The common argument in the postmodernist approach is that any claim that I make to say the scientific method of understanding the world is more accurate than, for example, the traditional Chinese or the Ayurvedic Indian method is a way of preserving my own political and economic dominance and that of science over other cultural traditions that it has a political or economic motive. That's an important part of how postmodernism construes or understands conflicts between ways of, of looking at the world.
So as an example, um, this is from the Journal of Chinese Medicine, if no paradigm, that is no model of reality or set of metaphors, has absolute value, then there's no basis from which to judge another paradigm. Any paradigm will appear limited or incorrect from the perspective of a different one. So Chinese medicine will seem incorrect from a biomedical point of view and vice versa. Again, the notion is that all ways of knowing about the world are simply models or sets of metaphors, and one may look untrue or incorrect from the point of view of another, but all points of view are equally valid, and so there is no absolute or objective point of view with which we can say legitimately that one idea is true and another isn't. From another uh, journal, another author writing about why alternative medicine isn't compatible with evidence-based medicine. Proponents of EBM seem to assert that a medical epistemology based on the results of clinical research is preferable regardless of the underlying theory of disease and healing. We argue this position is untenable. The theory of disease and healing underlying a particular school of medical practice determines the appropriate epistemological framework. In other words, the only way that you can decide how to evaluate the effect of a medical approach is by taking as a given the theoretical foundations of that approach first. An evidence-based epistemology may not be coherent with the medical metaphysic or philosophy of the alternative discipline. So CAM, if it is to remain viable and truly alternative, must develop an alternative epistemic framework. This is a way of saying, if we want to practice alternative medicine, we not only don't need to justify it through scientific or evidence-based techniques, in fact, we shouldn't because those techniques are embedded in a certain approach, a certain cultural or philosophical or historical context, and they aren't applicable. They're just not useful for alternative therapies. This is a pretty radical point of view, but it's surprisingly common. Uh, it's not always articulated as clearly as this, and clearly this is a, a journal that's devoted to academic medicine and, and to looking at these things from a broader philosophical perspective. But ordinary practitioners of alternative therapies often imply these same kinds of relativism and postmodernism in describing why scientific evidence doesn't serve to validate or invalidate their practices. Cultural relativism, as I said, very closely connected with the postmodernist point of view, says that all models of reality are just created by the beliefs and values of the culture in which they arise. Judging the practices of one culture by those of another is fundamentally out of bounds. And here's an example from the uh, textbook of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Although the basic concepts and conceits of Western and Chinese medicine differ, both address the same physical disorders. TCM considers neither the endocrine nor peripheral nervous system, and Western medicine has no format for diagnoses of disease caused by factors such as heat, cold, wind, damp. These are factors that are, are important in the Chinese traditional folk way of evaluating health and disease. So what the authors are saying here is that both what she calls what they call western medicine which i would call conventional or science-based medicine because it's still the dominant form of medicine in china today as well as everywhere else that this conventional medicine and chinese medicine have different sets of metaphors for describing the world but they're both just that they're just different metaphors neither one is more or less true they're just different ways of looking at it a more extreme articulation of that idea comes again from the journal of chinese medicine a shaman applying a curse does not consider it to be a placebo, nor does his victim. To them, real magic is involved. To interpret it otherwise is to make a culturally, paradigmatically biased judgment. We can never prove the shaman wrong, only offer an alternative explanation. I mean, this fundamentally is saying that notions of science and magic are just different but equally legitimate ways of describing health and disease. And I think that is as fundamentally incompatible with science and evidence-based medicine as it is possible to be. And so to the extent that these ideas inform alternative practices, there's a real problem with incorporating those practices into medicine if we're going to think of medicine as a science-based uh, approach. Vitalism, again, the function of living organisms are ultimately determined by some vital force, some uh, energy 
and that force is not physical, it's not constrained by the laws of physics and chemistry, so it can do or be anything and cannot be manipulated or predicted in the way that physical things can. You cannot measure the vital force, you can't quantify it, and you can't investigate it in objective scientific terms. It can only be understood in intuitive terms through, through subjective perception, faith, revelation, meditation. Therapies which address only the physical body and not the spiritual or the vital force are, are incomplete. They don't work because they're missing the point. And again, that creates a problem when scientific medicine says the only things that we can legitimately talk about when we're dealing with medicine from a scientific point of view are physical things. This essentially says, if you really accept vitalism at face value, that conventional medicine is, is effectively useless because it misses the whole point of health and disease. Vital forces are central to the theoretical foundations of many of the most popular alternative therapies. And they have different names in each of these therapies, the, the details of how they're described, what they're purported to be, how they work, how they can be uh, manipulated, differ. But again, through the secretist or eclectic perspective, those differences are not seen as making these ideas incompatible. And from the point of view of a postmodernist or, or cultural relativist perspective, all of these are seen as equally legitimate metaphors for describing a central idea which is vital to health and disease. In acupuncture or traditional Chinese medicine, qi uh, is the vital force, the name for the, the spiritual energy that's understood to be a significant factor in health and disease. D.D. Palmer, the originator of chiropractic, called this force innate intelligence and proposed that this force originated in the brain and flowed down through the body, through the spinal cord and through the nerves, and that's how chiropractic influenced this force and its ability to heal in multiple parts of the body. Homeopathy also makes reference to a vital force or a life force and sees its remedies as generating or preserving health largely through manipulating this force which Hahnemann, the, the originator of homeopathy, specifically referred to as a non-physical or spiritual force. Ayurveda, which is the traditional Indian approach and historically closely related to acupuncture and Chinese medicine, uh, refers to the vital force as prana. Reiki, which is a spiritual uh, healing mechanism, it talks about spiritual energies, life forces, even something that, that one would not imagine initially as a vitalist point of view, which is the argument for raw diets, often distinguishes raw food from cooked food in terms of life energy. And, uh, and some of the proponents of raw diets argue that cooked food is dead food and that the life energy has been driven out of it and that's why it's not as healthy as raw food. So this is a widespread idea in many of the alternative therapies. Richard Popquist is a veterinarian who's a well-known uh, proponent of alternative therapies and, uh, and writes a blog for the Huffington Post, has also been in the leadership at the Alternative Holistic Veterinary Medicine Association, so a very well-known and respected figure in the field. And here's a quote from an interview with him. Acupuncture reconnects and balances life energy. Energy medicines such as homeopathy, homotoxicology, Reiki, cranial psychotherapy, and others align the physical, mental, and spiritual portions of the organism. Yes, I did say spiritual, and that is a big part of holistic medicine, recognizing the spiritual nature of life. Another uh, set of authors writing about herbal medicine say, Herbal medicine is an empiricist, holistic, and vitalist in orientation. So even in areas which I think we could agree there are likely to be true chemical, physically active components to the therapy that might very well have both risks and benefits, some practitioners of these approaches, such as herbal medicine, argue that, that there's more to it than that, that there is a spiritual or vitalistic component to their therapy, which attempting to take away through the scientific investigation of herbs as drugs, for example, seeking the active ingredient, is a way of, of missing the point and of sort of removing from the alternative practice its key and most important element.
another prominent author in the holistic health movement, holistic practitioners believe that vital life energy is the most important factor in the health of a patient. Because medical science has defined itself on strictly physical basis, it is true that vitalism is unscientific. By definition, vitalism embraces a concept about a non-physical force that can never be understood within the current scientific medical paradigm. This is about as clear a statement, I think, as possible of how some components to the alternative health movement are fundamentally incompatible with science and with evidence-based medicine. And it's a statement of that coming from an advocate for the alternative health movement, not a critic. There is, as I mentioned before, also quite a bit of ambivalence about scientific evidence. There are both individuals and organizations that embrace a scientific approach to unconventional therapies within the CAM community, and also many who argue that science is either fundamentally incompatible and irrelevant to alternative practices, or at least not yet developed to the point where it can say anything definitive about whether these things are safe and effective or not. There's always an acknowledgement of the value of science, and part of this is because consumers, animal owners, are understood to respect science and to value science. So science is an effective marketing tool, and it's often acknowledged as having value, and at the same time, positive findings are promoted and negative results are dismissed or not acknowledged. Uh, confirmation bias, which we talked about at the very beginning, it plays a role in this. And it is frequently argued by proponents of these unconventional therapies that they should be accepted in the absence of research evidence because there is other kinds of evidence for them. Anecdotal evidence, history, tradition, that sort of thing. And the burden of proof is often placed on skeptics or critics rather than on the people who are themselves promoting and advocating these therapies. Plausibility is frequently dismissed as a meaningful way of evaluating the truth of a claim about a medical therapy and is simply chalked up to a kind of bias. The notion that something which is fundamentally inconsistent with established scientific principles should be viewed as suspect and less likely to be true than something that builds on these principles is just seen as one kind of cultural bias rather than as a legitimate way to evaluate these things. As part of this ambivalence, there is what I call special pleading, meaning an argument made that these alternative therapies are fundamentally so different from conventional medicine that they should be evaluated in an entirely different way. One component to this argument is that, yes, we have research to show that these things work, but it's not published, it's suppressed, because mainstream journals refuse to acknowledge it. And the critical appraisal that looks at some kinds of evidence as better than others in terms of quality or level in the hierarchy is seen as a way of discriminating against research done in alternative therapies. The argument is also made that you know, we don't have the money to do research, and frankly, you know, the companies that do have the money, like the pharmaceutical companies, are so opposed to any competition that they deliberately don't provide funds to research our therapies. This, I think, is becoming less and less tenable as an argument because there is a great deal of information now available on the profit made by the herbal medicine community, by large homeopathic remedy producers such as Boiron in France, and by many other corporations. And in fact, mainstream pharmaceutical companies and pet food companies and other pr producers of herbal remedies or dietary supplements are getting involved in this alternative uh, set of approaches and making quite a bit of money off of it. It's a very profitable area. So I think this is less convincing as an argument. The case is also made that alternative therapies often emphasize the individual rather than general principles that can be applied to lots of different individuals with the same disease. Some even argue that there's no such thing as the same disease, that every individual is so unique that every disease must be approached as a completely independent and individual entity. And so the argument then is extended to say studies which are done on groups don't have anything to do with the individual. This I think is a little misinterpretation. There's no question that individuals 
prognosis is, for example, very difficult to predict from general understanding of the disease, and that the individual response to therapy may be difficult to predict based on statistical knowledge about how groups of individuals respond. But at the same time, very useful and pragmatic knowledge does come out of population-based research. The simplest way I explain this to a lot of people is, it is true that if you go to Vegas and you gamble, there's no way to predict for sure whether you're going to win big or lose. But statistically speaking, the casinos build their entire business model on the idea that most people are going to lose most of the time. And that model seems to be much more effective for them than the idea that every individual has a, an equal shot at getting rich when they go. So I think the notion that we can ignore statistical knowledge, even though it may not always be precisely applicable to individuals, is a form of, of denying the value of scientific evidence. And it is sometimes argued that some of these therapies are fundamentally untestable because they rely on vitalist ideas which can't be subjected to scientific investigation or for other reasons, and so they should simply be accepted on the basis of lower level evidence. There's also a real reluctance to accept anything as ever being disproven. Again, going back to something in the way of cultural relativism or postmodernism, there's a real reluctance in the alternative medicine community to judge, and particularly to judge negatively. And so the notion that, that any level of negative evidence or the absence of evidence after any level of effort goes into generating it should be viewed as a legitimate reason to reject an idea is not widely accepted. Here are some examples of this ambivalence to scientific evidence from, again, one of the leading uh, textbooks in veterinary herbal medicine. Although reductionism and experimental science have their place, they are simply a piece of the whole. Medicine and science are not the same. Although medicine has benefited greatly from the scientific approach, medical history always brings the pendulum back when dogma sets in. Even with perfect knowledge of the genetics, environment, psychology, and chaos potential of an individual, science may never allow us to predict his or her interaction with an herb or herbal practitioner. The individual practitioner reigns supreme in this decision making. So ultimately what we're saying is, sure, science is useful, but in the long run individuals are snowflakes and they're all different and there's simply no way that science can have the final word on whether a therapy works or not. All the evidence in the world that an herb is ineffective compared to placebo or conventional medicine doesn't mean that we shouldn't use that herb in individual patients if we have other less definable reasons for thinking it will work.